Greetings and welcome to the Q&A part two for our special Wisdom Wednesday that was recorded on September 28th featuring IKG's very own Anthony Browder. We were celebrating 40 years of IKG work and we had lots of questions that evening. So we decided to do a part two where we will do our best to answer the remaining questions. So let's start off with the first question by Joseph Seely, who traveled with us to Egypt a number of years ago. So he's been giving away your books, uh, Now Valley, and he is curious to know when the new updated version will be available. New updated version of Now Valley? Yes. Which is the 30th anniversary edition. I am looking at having that uh, available in 2023 should be late spring 2023 is what I'm looking at right now for the revised edition of Now Valley special 30 year anniversary edition. All right, excellent. The next question comes from Brother Willie Royal, who actually just purchased a, a number of IKG books and DVDs. Uh, Brother Willie asked if you have studied the relationship between Kemetic Temple architecture and the human psyche. So the Temple of Man by Swaller de Lubix comes to mind as a reference. Um, I've, I've looked into that, the relationship between the construction of temples and the association of specific activities that took place in certain rooms inside of temples that correspond to specific activities that take place within the human body. Uh, Swaller de Lubix was in the forefront of initiating that research and I've kind of expanded that into this field called architectonics, which is the use of, of the creation of spaces, buildings, structures, and spaces within and around buildings and their effects on people. So that also encompasses uh, the materials that are used, different types of stone, wood, glass, metal, uh, as well as different colors that are used, uh, the paints uh, and the walls or the color of the stone that is used to build the structures. So all of that is part of my ongoing um, research and analysis of architecture, sacred architecture, and the use of architectural designs in order to enhance certain activities. So uh, that's something that I will probably continue uh, studying and researching for the rest of my life. All right. The next question comes from uh, one of our Holy Royal family members, uh, or another uh, family member, Brad Lewis. He asks, uh, in which temple is the first depiction of the creation story? In which temple is the first depiction of the creation story? Um, I'd be hard pressed to identify a specific temple. I know the idea was, um, in several temples. And I would think that there may have been something at the temple of Ptah in Menefer or Memphis. And there also would have been something at uh, Temple of On or Heliopolis. Those are some of the ancient temples in Lower Kemet. And both of those temples have been destroyed. So all that's left is the, um, the footprint of where those temples once were. But this idea of the first creation was an idea that was incorporated into elements of, of every, every temple. Um, you know, and I, I, you know, I'm wondering now if the presence of uh, the sacred lake might have been a reference to the primordial waters uh, from which uh, creation began, but um, I would have to do some research into that to know for certain. All right, the next question comes from Sister Chloe. Where did the Moors go when forced from Spain? Uh, how big of a part did their early presence um, enlightening Europe later have on the Ma'afa? Um, that's a good question. That area, that subject matter is not necessarily my major focus of expertise. I know uh, when the Moors were expelled from Spain, they came back into Northern Africa. I think it's also important to, to note that while uh, the Moors did introduce the bath um, 
a number of scientific, architectural, and agricultural achievements in Europe, specifically um, Spain and what is now Portugal. Um, <clears throat> We also know or should note that the knowledge that they brought into Europe was knowledge that Arabs gained after the fall of Kemet. So um, most of the, let me, let me see if I can remember this correctly. Um, practically every star in our solar system has an Arabic name. And that's because of the Arab conquest the more Moorish conquest and the um, Arabs or the Muslims taking uh, the cosmology that was known in the Nile Valley and then interpreting it through an Arabic lens or an Islamic lens. Um, algebra we know is a um, um, Arabic word, algebra. Um, and so a lot of the sciences that um, Europe holds up as important to their development. A lot of that knowledge came from the Moorish invasion of Europe, but the Moors got it from Africans in the Nile Valley. And I think another important issue that needs to be examined is the role that uh, the Moors played and Islam played in destabilizing Northern Africa. Um, undermining the indigenous cultures and spiritual systems of Northern Africa, and then subjecting them to this new foreign religion. And the order of the day was either you convert or you die. So, um, you know, many religions have been used uh, or misused or abused as a means of conquest, and did not always have a spiritual intent behind them. So when we talk about you know, the Moors or, or any other people, we have to look at them through uh, a larger historical and cultural lens and not just place them on a pedestal simply because of um, some things that we want to, some positive things that we want to associate with them. We have to look at history and culture and people in a greater totality so that we can understand uh, just as Sankofa said, the good and the bad in, in the people, in the culture, in the society, so that we can learn from both. Okay. The next question comes from uh, Sister Joyce Wright. She asks, what does CII stand for? Uh, I don't know, Atlantis. What does CII stand for? Well, CII stands for the Cultural Imperative Initiative, and it is the uh, it actually was later um, transformed or upgraded into what is now called CIP, which is the Cultural Imperative uh, Program. So this is a program that is specifically geared for high school students where they are introduced to African and African-American history through Mr. Browder's first publication from the Browder file. So again, CII stands for Cultural Imperative Initiative now known as CIP, Cultural Imperative Program. All right. So if I can add to that, uh, CII started in California and was for students in San Jose, California. CIP was rebranded and reformatted as a, a national program for high school students across the country. Okay. Next question comes from uh, Charles Smith, who was with us this, Charles Smith from the Red Bus, who was with us this summer in Egypt. Um, Brother Charles said that Dr. Charles Dinkins said institutions are designed to outlive their founders and are validated by the service it renders to its people. So if an institution does not serve its people, it will die. So the question is, what are the black prints for the institutions to live beyond those you're grooming to take over? Um, well, I, I think if I can be a bit more precise, uh, what is IKG doing uh, specifically to groom the people that uh, would take over or continue this work? And um, one, lead by example, to create opportunities 
for young people to gain practical experience, hands-on experience, and to expose them to, to people and, and opportunities for them to learn and grow. Um, I'm reminded of one of Dr. John Henry Clark's famous quote, and that is, um, service is the highest form of prayer. So to be of service, service to your, your, com your community, your people, is a way of not only giving back, but giving forward. Um, you're creating opportunities to favorably influence um, lives of people who haven't been born, and on a very basic and fundamental level, that's the purpose of everything that, that IKG has done over the past 40 years, shaping the world for, uh, of those who have not been born by producing in the minds of their parents or grandparents values that uh, will be preserved and passed down to future generations. And by doing so, uh, we will live in the values that we pass on to those who come behind us. All right, the next question comes from Finch, uh, Frenchie Nash. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about Dr. Asa Hilliard and expound a bit on his works? Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Hilliard uh, was a educational psychologist. He um, was just a wonderful human being. He served as a psychologist and worked a lot with the National Association of Black Psychologists. He was also um, a Dean of Students at San Francisco State University for a number of years. Uh, he developed a, a close a working relationship with uh, Wade Nobles, who was also uh, at San Francisco State. Wade Nobles is also a noted um, psychologist. And um, Asa moved to Georgia State, where um, he was a, a scholar in residence. I'm forgetting the name of the specific scholarship that he, uh, position that he held at Georgia State, but he held that position um, until he passed in 2007. Uh, Asa was also a founding member of ASCAC, the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilization. Asa was a, um, an expert on, on testing and the shortcomings of testing that was used in school systems um, in California specifically and around the world. Asa was highly regarded as a historian, an educator, and a psychologist and consulted with individuals and organizations around the world, a wonderful brother, wonderful human being. And um, his uh, papers are now at the Atlanta University Com uh, Complex at Woodruff uh, uh, Library. And just uh, last month on the 21st of September, I believe, uh, the Woodruff Library held uh, their um, AC Hilliard conference. And I, I was just looking at pictures from the conference uh, just yesterday, as a matter of fact. And of course, Wade Nobles, uh, Joyce King, uh, and a host of scholars who work with ASA, were close with him, uh, were, were uh, participating at the conference. And ASA leaves behind uh, his wife, uh, Patsy Joe, former mayor of East Point, Georgia, and two children, uh, Roby and Hakeem. And Asa has written a number of books. Uh, one of my favorite books by Asa is Saba, The Reawakening of the African Mind. Saba, spelled S-B-A, The Reawakening of the African Mind. Uh, Paul Coates um, published a, a book of Asa's called, um, I think it was The Maroon Within. I think it was The Maroon Within. Uh, another good work. Uh, Asa has made... Um, a number of contributions to the Journal of African Civilizations. And one of the um, aspects of Ace's life that, that really endeared him to me was his participation in uh, coordination of the Nile Valley Conference, which was held in, at Morehouse uh, College in 1984. And it was that event 
that sealed my fate and made me decide that I wanted to walk in the footsteps of those brilliant scholars who presented a wealth of information about now Valley origins of culture and civilization. Um, I had the pleasure of traveling to Egypt with these, um, uh, I think about four times. And uh, much of what I do is modeled after the work that AC Hilliard did. And so it's fitting and proper that um, I named this project, the excavation project in Egypt in honor of A.C. Hilliard. And our responsibility is to document the Kushite presence in Kemet and to preserve the legacy of A.C. Hilliard. So the A.C. Restoration Project uh, is a international project, but it also has domestic implications uh, in that we want to take the knowledge gained from the A.C. Restoration Project and make that information accessible to people here in the United States, particularly schools, school systems and students and teachers here in the United States. And um, one of the first domestic projects done under the auspices of the Asa Restoration Project is the John Henry Clark Enhanced History Project. Um, and more will be forthcoming about that in the next month or so. All right. And so just to that point, uh, we did have a question uh, from Sister Cheryl Lee, who inquired about a history curriculum that would be available to homeschoolers based around all of the work that you've done. So, of course, we have the broader file curriculum available through CIP um, that I think you have um, some intentions to develop a curriculum around the John Henry Clark project. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. And um... I'm thinking, I think in the Journal of African Civilizations, um, there is, no, 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 no. It was, it was a conference that Asa held in Atlanta on African-centered education. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult book to find, but it's one worth uh, adding to your library if you can find it. And in that particular publication, um, they have a curriculum and a bibliography for teaching African history and culture. And uh, Asa also played a similar role in developing the Portland Baseline Essays, which was one of the first national African-centered curriculum uh, that was developed in the 1980s. Uh, I'm pretty certain that you can go online and download a copy of that. Uh, it's, it was produced in the 80s, um, has a number of um, articles written by phenomenal scholars, Hunter Adams, John Henry Clark, um, and others, and I'm, I think you will also find that useful. So the resources out there definitely are out there. And Chico Kua has some wonderful material as well. Well, they specifically wanted to know about a curriculum surrounding your work, Mr. Oh, Bishop. well, Atlantis has done the uh, curriculum on the um, the Browder file essays, and as you mentioned previously, we are developing a curriculum that is tethered to the John Henry Clark Enhanced History Project. And then there is a study guide available that goes with uh, the complement Smile Valley Contributions to Civilization. So that is available on our website, ikg-info.com. All right, I'm going to combine the next two questions from Zizwe and Will William. Uh, when do you think the new museum in Cairo will be available uh, for people to visit? And will your artifacts uh, from the excavation be displayed at uh, an Egyptian museum or will you have your own museum? <laughs> um, well, when the Grand Egyptian Museum or gym will officially open is anybody's guess. Um, it's been delayed several years for a variety of reasons, COVID, um, the Arab Spring, and a host of other uh, complications have delayed the opening. Uh, I was told that it may open as early as November uh, 2022, um, time to coincide with the 100 year anniversary of the discovery of King Tut's tomb and the 200 year anniversary of Champollion's decipherment of the Rosetta Stone. Whether that happens remains to be seen. Um, and as to whether or not artifacts from 
our excavations will be in the uh, museum. There is a possibility, there's a very strong possibility that the Pyramidion that we found a couple of years ago may be transferred from the Luxor Museum to the Grand Egyptian Museum. And uh, who knows, we may find some, some new artifacts that may just in fact, uh, you know, may be something phenomenal that the museum will want to add to its collection. So um, stay tuned. We'll find out at some point in the near future. So for those who may not familiar, who, for those who may not be familiar with um, some of the artifacts that we did have or do have displayed at the Luxor Museum, can you highlight uh, two or three of those exhibits? Sure. Um, our last exhibition, which was done in about two years ago, um, 2019 to 2020, December, it was the, uh, the Pyramidion that we found in the open air court of Nesba Nejet. We also had an exhibit. We had three uh, exhibits, um, 17, 18, and 19 in um, the Luxor Museum. Uh, the first exhibit was a set of canopic jars that were put on display. And one of the canopic jars is inscribed to Aminurtis, the lady of the house. Uh, we don't quite know which Aminurtis it was, Aminurtis the first, Aminurtis the second. But uh, the lady of the house was a title that Kushite kings gave to their daughters. They were uh, the divine wives of Amen. So we have a set of canopic jars that we found in the side burial chamber in um, the first pillared hall of the tomb of um, Kerboshkin. And um, in 2018, we had an exhibition of approximately 104 artifacts that we found at the site, uh, the most numerous of which were uh, number of Swapti, small uh, figurines of specific personalities uh, who were to aid uh, the deceased in the afterlife. We have a number of those that we found as well as a host of uh, some burial equipment and some other artifacts. So um, yeah, we've got um, a number of things that uh, have been on display at the Luxor Museum as well as a catalog of um, the exhibition we did in 2018 in the uh, Luxor Museum. So, um, you know, what will be transferred to the Grand Egyptian Museum remains to be seen, but uh, I'm trusting that we will have at least one or two objects in that museum. Okay. All right. We are close to winding down. We have about six questions left. Uh, the next one comes from Peter. Um, now that you've been in stool, what is your next step in honoring this tribute? Mm -hmm. Well, um, <clears throat> the stoolman ceremony was um, a, a basic naming ceremony. And uh, from what I understand, we will be going back to Ghana to get additional training and or uh, initiation uh, we'll be meeting with uh, priests within the village of Moray. The priests were responsible for giving us um, each of our names. There will be some other information that will be shared with us as to the responsibilities and duties that we'll have. I would like to think that one of the major um, projects that I'll be participating in and, and steerheading will be the... Um, studying of the Moray traditions, uh, oral traditions primarily, but the stories of their ancestors having migrated to Ghana from Mali via the Nile Valley. I'm really interested in, in digging up as much information about that migration as I, as I can. This is something that has been written about by numerous scholars, both African and, and, and European. Uh, but it will be interesting to get as much documentation from uh, indigenous Africans themselves about their ancestral migrations. And as I mentioned previously, in 2016, we found uh, Adinkra symbols painted, uh, the Sankofa Adinkra symbol painted on the ceiling of two tombs. 
So that's another area that I would like to spend some more time investigating and seeing if we can prove concretely uh, when these migrations occurred, uh, what was brought from the east to the west and how that information has been, has retained its um, original um, knowledge. So uh, there's so many avenues, so many opportunities open to us. Um, I don't know uh, where it's going to take us, but I know it's going to be an incredible journey and I look forward to it. All right, the next question comes from Ed. Uh, other than meditation, what other methods do you employ to build your focus and discipline to their current form? Um, I guess, you know, meditation and just creating space to think. Uh, I, you know, I love being out in nature, I love walking, I love clearing my head and just creating opportunities to, to download ideas and information and to be inspired to uh, work on some ideas that, that come to me and, and, and develop them. One of the main things that I need to do is to take so many things off my plate so that I can spend more time being still, spend more time being at home and uh, writing and flushing out some of my ideas. So um, being still is a very important part of that process for me and allowing ideas to flow, uh, allowing myself time to process ideas that I have or uh, fine tune, uh, refine ideas that I've been thinking about in my head and create space for, uh, for them to evolve. Um, I am uh, a creative person. Um, I am predominantly bright brain in my, in my thinking process. And I really like nurturing that part of my being and, and have to create more spaces for that to happen. I, I really need that, I really need that. So uh, just stay tuned and hopefully you'll be seeing more uh, productive work uh, coming from uh, IKG in the uh, months and years to come. So considering all of the accomplishments that you have made, um, Brother Brad asked, at what moment in your life did you know this life path was for you? Hmm. At what point did I know? Um, that's a difficult question to answer, only because it's been a, uh, a steady progression. Uh, I could say, well, I guess one of the one of the best ways that I can answer that question is uh, there's an old saying that the two most important days in a person's life uh, are the day that you were born and the day that you understand why you were born. So I was born July 26, 1951. And the day that I came to understand why I was born was February the 21st, 1977, when I met Ivan Van Sertima and he opened my eyes to a new world. And that's what put me on the path. And as I reflect on my life, I can see that in 1975, uh, I met uh, Nana Kwabana Brown, who introduced me to African culture and African spirituality. And that's what kind of grounded me and prepared me to meet um, uh, Van Sertima. And Van Sertima then opened the way for me to begin to understand the Kemetic roots of the African roots of ancient Kemet. And that then led me to the discovery of Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, John Jackson, Jay Rogers. And that led to my first trip to, to Egypt. So I can, I see a series of dots that if I uh, connect them all together, they will probably form a portrait that looks a lot like Karaka men. So to be continued. Okay. Well, speaking of Karaka moon and names, I know, uh, I think, was it Dr. Finch? She was the first to start calling you Karak. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Sister Diane asked, uh, what is the significance of changing birth names to kings and queens of the past? Um, well, I, I would say not just kings and queens, uh, but to names of personalities that 
have a, a vibration that resonates with your being, your purpose and your mission. I remember Asa saying that at specific stages in the lives of his children, he gave them new names. And so a name represents a rite of passage, a rite of passage from childhood into adolescence, from adolescence into young adulthood, young adulthood into adulthood, adulthood into middle age, middle age into uh, junior eldership, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, we're not the same. Uh, we're constantly evolving, we're constantly growing. Uh, I forget who it was who said that if you're the same person today that you were uh, a decade ago, you wasted 10 years. Uh, it's like every, every, every 10 years or so, every decade, we recalibrate ourselves, we're growing, we're evolving. And so a name should reflect uh, who you are becoming or who you wish to become. So the naming ceremonies a part of activities that acknowledge that we're all here as spiritual beings having a human experience. And as our spirit evolves, as our consciousness evolves, then a new name is an adequate uh, label to place on a person to describe the person that you are or the person that you are becoming. And as long as we continue to live, we should continue to become. And what we will ultimately become, I think, is a contract that our soul made in a prior, in a prior lifetime. So uh, names are important in that they mark a transition or growth. Um, and the names don't necessarily have to be of kings and queens. I think oftentimes we place too much attention on kings and queens. And what I, what I have to tell folks is less than one-tenth of the population in Africa was kings and queens. The vast majority of people were, 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 were farmers, were, were thinkers, were administrators, were doctors, uh, engineers, uh, philosophers, scientists, thinkers, mathematicians, uh, dentists, uh, carpenters, um, um, masons, administrators, you know, mathematicians, astronomers. So uh, kings and queens are all right, but the reality is kings and queens didn't get much done. Kings and queens were placeholders. It was the people who worked for the kings and queens, uh, the noblemen, the noblewomen, the priests and the priestesses. They were the ones who did the work. So I would much rather uh, have a name that is associated with someone who actually produced than someone who took the credit for uh, what others produce. That's just my personal opinion. All right, and we'll close with the last question from Brother Robert Whiting. He asked uh, what your thoughts are regarding whether or not African Americans will be treated as equals in America, and if not, what do you envision as options? Well, given the history of America, uh, given how America was born in sin, um, born with the uh, theft of land of the indigenous people, born out of the um, enslavement of African people and, um, and how this country has continued to abuse and disrespect um, people of color. Uh, matter of fact, America, America has excelled in abusing and disrespecting other Americans. Um, I subscribe to an understanding of karma, cause and effect I have lived my life with the knowledge that what goes around comes around, you reap what you sow. Given that reality, you know, America has had numerous opportunities to do right, uh, to do right, and has consistently chosen uh, to do wrong. And there would be a price to pay for that. So um, Africans living in America are fortunate on one hand, to live in the wealthiest, most powerful nation on the face of this planet, which means that we have an obligation and a responsibility to take advantage of all of the opportunities for advancement that are here in this country that do not exist in other countries. Uh, we have an obligation and a responsibility to take full advantage of education that is available to us here. We have uh, an obligation and a responsibility to take advantage of employment opportunities that are available here, that aren't available anywhere else. And that uh, should we choose to go somewhere else, 
to take our time, our talent, and our treasures somewhere else. We should not go as beggars. We should go as people who are um, who have attained certain gifts and talents that we're willing to share with others wherever we may go, be it uh, Ghana, Senegal, Gambia, the Ivory Coast, South Africa, uh, Kemet, you name it. Uh, or or <laughs> if we look at what some wealthy uh, white citizens are planning to do, they're planning to go to the moon. They're planning to, to go to outer space and live in a space station. They're planning to go to, to Mars or wherever. Um, people have always traveled. People have always explored. Um, and I'm, I'm one who truly loves uh, to travel. And um, I'm not afraid to go someplace else to uh, build someplace else. But I also understand that you can't go someplace as beggars. Uh, you should bring something with you that will enhance the quality of life wherever you go. And so we should take advantage of every opportunity available to us here to learn something, to learn a skill, uh, to cultivate some resources that can assist you and assist others. Um, Again, guess, yeah, I want to close with uh, one of the first questions that I responded to that had to do with service. We're here to serve. You know, we're here to, um, to advance humankind. Uh, we're here to follow in the footsteps of the ancestors who have preceded us by generations and generations and generations. Uh, we're supposed to stand on, on their shoulders and not pick their pockets. Uh, we're not supposed to be standing around scratching our heads, wondering uh, where we should go and what we should do. Uh, we've been left wonderful examples of what we have the capacity to do. And our responsibility now is to study those examples, replicate them as best we could, and build for eternity. That's why we are here, at least speaking for myself, that's why I'm here. I'm here to, to build something substantive that will outlive me and that will uh, create uh, spaces and thoughts and ideas that will influence uh, future generations. And when that happens, as that, well, not when that happens, because it's already been happening. It's been happening for 40 years. Um, I, I trust that the work that I have done, uh, the work that I've done, the work that I've done with you, Atlantis, the work that you would do, Atlantis, the work that IKG has done, will continue to create ripples through time and space that will be pleasing to the ancestors and that will be beneficial to us when we come back um, as our descendants and, and uh, have an opportunity to add to what we've already created and make it better than it was before. That's an excellent way to close out the Q&A, Dad. Okay. I'll take this moment to um, thank everyone for submitting questions and thank you, Dad, for creating the time to uh, answer these additional questions. And so I also want to thank everybody for, for their interest and their support over the last 40 years. And I trust that um, support will continue to come this way for the next 40 plus years. All right, we'll see you next month. Next week. Can you see that? Can you can you imagine 60 years from now, the 100th anniversary of IKG? <laughs> Just picture that. So let's let's end <laughs> let's end this QA with that thought in mind. And let's look at what we can do to manifest that thought. I hope you all are gonna be around be back to commemorate the 100th anniversary of IKG. Um, that, that would be a phenomenal event. And I look forward to seeing some of you all then. I mean, some folk I don't want to see, but some of you all I look forward to seeing uh, for the 100th year anniversary of IKG in 60 years. Sounds like a plan. It's a date. <laughs> I'll see you there. <laughs> all right. Take care. All right. Bye. Peace.